Thanks so much for joining us. This is another episode of the Ticats Off-Season Roundup presented by WeatherTech. Thank you to WeatherTech for sponsoring this, uh, our first kind of dipping our toe into the podcast waters here for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. I'm your digital host, Louis B, and I'm very pleased to be wrapping up our uh, first series here with the CEO of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. That, of course, is Mr. Scott Mitchell, and he's right there on your screen. Uh, Scott, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks very much for having me on, Louis. I've been enjoying the podcast so far. Great stuff. I, I, I very much appreciate that, and I, I'd like to give you kind of uh, the floor for this first question because, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of feedback from fans, um, you know, Obviously, they haven't had their football team to cheer for for a while, but we've been trying our best to keep them entertained, to keep them keep them going. And I want to give you the floor here to just give a message to our fans, whatever you'd like to say to Ticats fans who are watching this. Uh, well, our fans are awesome, man. It's uh, it's been a really special uh, few years, or almost a decade, really, to build uh, this incredible passion with our fan base. We've always had, of course, great fans in Hamilton, but I think, in particular, since we moved into Tim Hortons Field, we've really established a incredible uh, rapport with our fans. They've just been unbelievably supportive and uh, get Tim Hortons field rocking every week. And, um, you know, it's really been at times emotional for us uh, through this last uh, you know, year and a half. Uh, we've had more than 90% of our fans stick with us with their season seats and leaving their money uh, with us uh, in order to get back on the field. And uh, that, that's really incredible when you think about it and, and you think about what's important to our fans. Of course, it's their family. It's, uh, it's their faith, I'm sure, but I'm not too too sure that sometimes uh, Tide Cats football is too far behind on that too. So it's really, really a special feeling uh, knowing uh, the commitment our fans have to the organization uh, and to our players. And of course, uh, you know, Bob's very proud of that as well in terms of what we've built uh, here in Hamilton. So just really want to thank the fans and all of our partners for their incredible support and uh, can't wait to see them at Tim Hortons Field this summer. The one thing that I, I think about when, when I think about the fans is that, you know, you mentioned the 90% holdover of season ticket holders. Like for me, it'd be like, I don't want to give up my shot of seeing what this team can do once they hit the field again. Because if you go back to 2019, that team had so, so many highs, it, it, you know, the, the undefeated season at Tim Hortons field, uh, you know, just kind of rolling through the playoffs up until the great cup. But that team was so good. I feel like there's that excitement that even with, a pandemic in between there's still so much excitement around this team that is built currently as it is right now well i think you're right i mean listen we've uh we've played a lot of playoff football we've we've uh, we've had a lot of big wins we've had some heartbreaking losses obviously but i think that uh, that 2019 team was special there's no doubt i think there's only been four or five teams in cfl history that have won 16 football games regular season plus the playoffs and and been undefeated at uh, at home and uh it's funny because Coach O surprised me by asking me to say a few words to the team in the in the end of the year meeting uh, after we got back from Calgary, and of course everyone was very disappointed. But uh, if I could do it all over again, I would have said to the guys, "Hey, how many guys in this room and how many coaches have ever won 16 games in a season and put uh, put 10 home wins on the board?" And I don't think too many guys would have you know, put up their hands. So, you know, it was a very special year. Obviously, uh, uh, very disappointing that uh, we just didn't play well. Really, the only game we really didn't play well the whole year was the Grey Cup and. Uh, of course, all the credit to Winnipeg. They really came in and thumped us. But, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a team that was 15 and three. And really, the three losses were, were games we could have won. Uh, I'll never forget Delvin Bro making a play in Saskatchewan where I think Cody Fajardo must have had super glue on his hand because otherwise Delvin would have chopped the ball out of his hand at the five and we win that game. And, of course, uh, had a missed field goal or blocked field goal at Calgary yeah. to win that game and, and uh, recovered a short kick uh, or whatever it was, punt, uh, uh, in Montreal where we could have won that game. So it was a special year, great group of coaches and players. And I know everybody's just super excited to get back on the field this year and uh, pick up where we left off. I think, I think it's pretty telling that, that you're, you're recalling the specific details of the losses, right? I mean, it's, it's one thing to remember the wins, but, but you got to remember those losses too. And, and just talking to the guys, you know, in the last week doing this podcast, um, you know, they, they, they kind of have the same message that you did in terms of, you know, 2019 happened, you know, let's, let's give Winnipeg the credit. Let's you know, they had a great team, but there, there really is kind of a chip on the shoulder that, that we have an opportunity to get it done here when we hit the field again. Yeah, I think so. I mean, listen, we've got a great group of core guys that have been with us for a long time. As I said, played a lot of playoff football, uh, been in great cups, been in a lot of Eastern finals. And, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we've had lots of chances, let's be honest. And, uh, we're just looking forward to, uh, getting over that final hump. And uh, if you want to call it a chip on the shoulder, I think the guys just want to play and compete. 
Um, and uh, I think O's just got this great mentality uh, on the team. They come out and compete every week, and uh, um, that's all you can do. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that we got great cup at home this year, which uh, is a significant opportunity for us that I know everyone's pretty excited about. Yeah, and we're, we're going to get to the Great Cup 2021. I know we're all excited about that, but I do want to stick on this topic of just the team that we have assembled right now because uh, you're, you're a football guy. You've been around the sport a long time. And, uh, you know, when I talk about the team with people outside of the organization, they always ask about, you know, Drew Alamang and, and, uh, and of course, Sean Burke and, and two guys that have really been with this organization, I think combined about 25 years experience uh, you know, with this team. And, and you mentioned core guys. That, that kind of starts at the top, right? When you talk about core guys, you know, I think Drew Alamang and Sean Burke and, and, and the role that they have and, and the staff underneath them. Well, I think on both sides of the ball, or, or of the football team or organization, I guess I should say business <laughs> side and the football side, uh, both sides of the ball, as they say. But, uh, you know, Berkey obviously came in. Uh, he came in uh, from, from actually MLSE uh, and uh, was connected to me from a, from a friend uh, who, who thought he did some great things on the uh, on the. Uh, community side in, in Toronto and uh, we brought him in on the community side. He did a great job and just kept on working his way up through the organization. And, uh, you know, he's just been a tremendous, tremendous asset to the organization, cares about the players and the coaches. He cares about the organization and does a fantastic job. And of course, Drew Alamang, you know, whose dad played in the, in the league for a long time. Drew is a CFL or lifer and uh, he came up uh, the hard way, as they say too. Drew came up through, uh, started on the equipment side and, uh, I'll never forget Dan Rambo was one of the first to kind of notice that Drew had a real talent and acumen for evaluating players. He'd done some reports for, uh, for Dan and Dan was a very successful uh, football executive and uh, he saw a lot in Drew Alamang and then OB uh, felt the same way Bob Obilovich and Drew just, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't say a heck of a lot. Uh, Berkey's the more verbose of the two, but uh, they're a great combination. And of course they've had some great people that, uh, that have helped them along the way, whether it be Ken Austin or Bob Obilovich or, as I said, Dan Rambo. They've had some great mentors, and uh, those two guys do a great job, but there's been lots of other people in that organization for a long time. Spencer Bohm, uh, um, you know, Rich Macero has done a great job for us. Uh, Drew Schoenstein, who's our, who's our equipment guy, who is, like, the most talented guy you're ever going to meet and is just a glue guy for the organization. Drew's been with us forever, and, uh, you know, it's just a great group of people that love going to work together. And I, I, you know, I miss them all, seeing them all the time at Tim Ward's Field. And so looking forward to, to doing that. But I think when we first started, we talked about continuity, but don't, continuity only really works if you have the right people. Uh, and we definitely have the right people. And it's, it's about caring. It's about, uh, um, you know, belief in each other and, and uh, that, that unity that Coach O talks about in terms of uh, having that one goal. And we certainly feel like we've assembled a good organization. And, uh, we got to get back on the field and uh, start playing some football. You mentioned Coach O, and, and I don't think anyone could have – I mean, you could have predicted the success he had last year, but it, it's easy to forget sometimes that that was his first season as a CFL head coach, you know, winning coach of the year, franchise best record, undefeated at home. Uh, obviously, his first year as head coach had been with the organization. I do want to ask you about, you know, how did you get him back? Because he went to Fresno State, you know, turned their defense around, was, was the 13th best defense in the nation in college football. And then he came back to the Tiger Cats. I have to imagine there, there, that was a, a conversation that, that I'm sure you were involved in. So, I mean, as much as you can tell us, I'm curious to know how you got Coach O back up here. Well, first of all, I'd probably go back to, uh, you know, a tough, a tough uh, time in the organization in terms of uh, decision-making. I think, uh, you know, Ken Austin had so much success for us uh, for those four years. I think it was from 13 to 17. And we've been to two great cups and three East finals and we've, four straight, uh, I think, uh, uh, home playoff appearances or three home playoff appearances. And, uh, and after 17, um, you know, I, I had been, I'd gotten very involved in a lot of other Bob's businesses and probably, you know, we were probably a bit of a tired franchise at the time. And, uh, we lost a playoff game uh, to Edmonton that year. And, um, we'd come off, you know, some success, but really some tough, tough, uh, defeats, whether it be the two Grey Cups or the East Final in Ottawa, and I think I think we were just a little bit tired. Um, and so I was probably a little distracted at the time. And, and in retrospect, I probably could have we probably could have talked about Kent uh, moving into a GM role full time. I think he would have done a fantastic job. And uh, and I bring that up about Coach O because you know we probably could have at that time said, okay, Kent, you know why don't you uh, focus on being the VP of football? been a great run but let's let's move O in to, to be the head coach and 
in retrospect, you know, I think about that all the time, but you know, maybe, maybe he comes and maybe he leaves uh, if, if uh, he doesn't go first to Fresno state. So he went down to Fresno state and uh, um, had a great time. We, we stayed in contact, obviously uh, he did a great job down there. And then, um, um, you know, we brought June Jones in to, to help out uh, the team that year to get him back turned around and June did a fantastic job. And, uh, I was actually down in I was down in San Francisco actually uh, doing some work on one of Bob's ventures and uh, and O was down in Fresno and uh, I called him up and said hey I'm only a couple hours away why don't uh, why don't we have uh, we have dinner together and uh, bad news was he said well I'm not coming to San Francisco I'm working here I got a, I got a team to coach so if you want to hook up you better come and hook up in the Fresno so I drove to uh, to Fresno we uh, which was an interesting drive but. Uh, we had a uh, we had a uh, great dinner, um, great barbecue place there in Fresno, not far from campus. And uh, I could tell that he was having a great time, but I could tell that he uh, he also missed uh, missed coaching uh, up in the CFL and and maybe college, you know, wasn't uh, what he wanted to do for the next ten years. And so we had kind of talked about uh, what he wanted to do, and um, you know, really it was an unbelievable tribute to both June Jones and Coach O that. Um, you know, O left an incredible job at Fresno where, you know, he'd, he'd been nominated for co assistant coach of the year, as you said. Um, really, you know, world was his oyster a little bit down in the, in the NCAA. Uh, but he wanted to come up and, and he wanted to learn the other side of the football, which, you know, I, I don't know if there's too many cases of a coach who's that kind of a red hot candidate who kind of wants to give up that specialization that he has uh, as a defensive coordinator and would have been a head coach. And he wanted to come back up and, and, uh, learn the offense and learn the offense from June Jones that June had. And, uh, I think that's an incredible person that does something like that. It's about self-improvement for O and, uh, and, uh, really making himself a better coach and a better person. And then to have June Jones, uh, you know, uh, bring, bring O in when he didn't know him and never really met him. Um, but he heard all these incredible things about O. Um, and that was the plan, you know, let's get, let's get coach O back up here. And, you know, June, uh, made it very clear that, you know, I got to take this year to year for June. He's, you know, he had a pretty good gig going in Hawaii. So, you know, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to live in Hamilton 12 months of the year, 365 days of the year, but let's take this year by year. And, and uh, so I just was appreciative of June willing to do that. And of course, O to come back up was awesome. And, uh, and as I say, a little bit to the rest of history and uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can have some more success in 2021. I mean, June Jones really that, I, I remember, you know, you mentioned the the, the good years that, that that was we had, you know, for for a while there. But that that 8 start, and and that's that's kind of when when June was brought in as an assistant coach to Ken Austin, and and really, June Jones was a turning point for for this organization, the way it's currently built, and and just, you know, I think fans when they look back, they're going to look back at that June Jones hire and think like, okay, you know. I think they got that one right for sure. They got that one right. What what can you tell us about about June Jones and just just about the way he worked and and the way, like you said, he was able to hand off uh, the, this team to to Coach O. Well, I think again we had a lot of success in that run with Coach Austin, but uh, that 2018 year or 17 year, I guess it was uh, was tough, man. That was the I was the I was the down point of uh, of our group's tenure here for sure. And I remember. Uh, we got absolutely whacked in Calgary, which, you know, our, our organization, our team just hadn't done that in 10 years, whatever it was. And, uh, you know, we've been a great cup playoff team and, and we just got trounced in Calgary. And I remember, uh, to be honest with you, John Huffnagel uh, called me up at like six in the morning the next day and just was trying to cheer me up and said, uh, you know, you got to take a, you got to take a look at what's going on, man. And, uh, and that afternoon, uh, Eric Tillman and I flew down to, uh, to Portland. There was a, there was a direct flight from Calgary to Portland. Um, ET talked my ear off on a small plane for, uh, for two and a half hours and it was, uh, but it was enjoyable. And, uh, we met June at the, uh, at the airport, uh, at a little bar or restaurant at the airport and spent a couple of hours with him. And, uh, really at that time we just said, Hey, you know, our offense was just struggling like heck and it was just a tough deal. And Zach was frustrated. Everybody was frustrated. And we just said, Hey, would you come up and, uh, and uh, help us out. And uh, he said, let me think about it. And then uh, he joined us up, up the next week at Edmonton. And, and actually we played pretty well that week, but had another loss. And then, uh, and then a couple of weeks later, it just kind of became clear that we needed a fresh, fresh voice. And 
June came in, man, and I'll tell you what, that team by the end of the year was a good team. I remember. I was, I was I, just about I, to say, like, there uh, there was that, if we could get in, right? If we could uh, get into the playoffs. And I remember, you know, week 18, week 19, just being like, okay, if we can just get there, like, we can just win a game. And, and, and I think other teams were worried about what that team could have done if they got into the playoffs. Well, that year, man, we played a game in at home against Toronto and, uh, and I remember, uh, and of course, Jarvis went on to win the Great Cup that year. But I remember uh, Jeremiah just missed Luke on a on a corner or a, or a, a sail route, and uh, it would have been a first down. It really would have sealed the game. Uh, Luke was wide open, and it's only through a great throw. It just just didn't hook up, and uh, and we were in charge of that game. And then they came back, and I think Posey actually got the touchdown on a third down from Ricky Ray, which was just a ridiculous throw. Um, and if we had won that game, we probably would have been in the playoffs and, and who knows if the Argos go on to win that great cup. But, uh, that by the end of the year, that was a good team and there was a belief back on the team. And, uh, and of course, then we rolled back into, uh, to, uh, 18 and really had a great team in 2018, to be honest with you, but just got decimated with, uh, with injuries. And I think we lost four of our starting receivers, uh, in the back half of the year, but came back, rallied, won a big game against BC in the playoffs. And then, uh, and they got beat in the East final, but really June, June got us going back and June really, you know, he did, he brought that mojo back to the organization and got us rolling again. And uh, he deserves a tremendous amount of credit. I'm a much better person for having met June. I consider him a good friend. He's a, he's a great dude, very unique individual, but a great guy. And we, we were very fortunate to have him with us. Yeah. I don't think I've had as much fun covering uh, any sport, any team than that, that, that season with June, man. He, he, he's always good for a quote. And I know as a reporter, I always love a good quote and, and June always had a good one. Well, you guys, uh, ready to go. You guys loved him because he was liable to say <laughs> anything. So you guys loved him. Yeah, I was, I was, I used to look over to go, go and say, should he have told us that or no? Like that was, that was, the, it was with June Jones. Um, let's talk more about uh, 2021 because your know, fans want to know you're talking, you're talking, there's the way you're talking about the season, the way we're talking about the great cup. I just have to get you on record here. I mean, your confidence level that, that football will be played this year. Oh yeah, we're going to play football this year. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, I got my great cup uh, p- hoodie on here, whatever you call it, pullover. Uh, so uh, yeah, no, we're going to play. There's no doubt in my mind. Everybody's everybody's incented to play, and uh, um, you know, obviously, uh, first and foremost, you worry about people's health and safety, and uh, and of course, um, you know, we're going to get through this. I think it's it's right now we're in this strange period right now where there's lots of good news, but the, you know, the virus is still, is still there in some ways in Southern Ontario, it's come back a little bit. But I think when you look at the, the bigger picture and kind of see where we're going to be in May and June, it looks like several provinces will be fully vaccinated by that period of time. Ontario just coming in this morning, uh, looks like they're going to have a, about three more million doses in the next couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, well, it's been really challenging. And of course, as I said, you always think about the frontline workers and the health and safety of people and how difficult it's been. I think there's a lot of reason for optimism and uh, I don't have any doubt we're going to play football this year. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when, uh, when we're going to be able to start training camp. And, uh, you know, we're excited about it. And of course, uh, I think the 2021 Grey Cup is just going to be a phenomenal party for Canadians. Uh, of course, you know, help, you know, it'll be safe and we'll do it right the right way. But uh, I think in a lot of ways, you know, it's funny. People will tease me for, uh, uh, they won't think of me as saying the word emotional twice in one interview, but uh, I think it'll be very emotional for a lot of people to get back together for Grey Cup uh, come November, and I think we'll put on a great show. I mean, and, and that's really kind of, that, that, that's kind of there, right? The, the Grey Cup 2021, we're, 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 it's going to happen, and it, it just seems like after the, the year and a half that people have gone through, this is an opportunity to, to really exhale. Like to, to, it's, it's almost going to be cathartic for some people. And I feel like, does that add more pressure to what you guys are doing that, that, okay, you know, this is going to be the first opportunity for people to really get back together, to really get to celebrate. Does it, does it, you feel the pressure of that a little bit? No, to be honest with you, it's funny. I was driving around this weekend uh, in my car, uh, just thinking about them and some of the staff will laugh when I say this, but uh, I was just thinking about that first game, man, back at Tim Hortons Field and the, get the players to run out of that tunnel out of Caretakers Club and trying to think about what, what music we'll be playing because uh, that's going to be an unbelievable scene when, we, when our players come running out of that tunnel for the first time. And uh, I think if anything else, it's just going to be relief, cathartic. I think, uh, you know, I think it's just, it's, just uh, it's not natural for us as uh, humans not to be able to socialize together and spend time together. And uh, I think it'll be it'll be very cathartic for people to get back together in a very safe and 
and healthy way and cheer on their Hamilton Tiger Cats. I know, uh, I'm sure there will be, uh, there'll be, uh, there'll be some tears, man, when, when guys come out of that, uh, caretakers club and get back on the field for the first time. So the fact that we were hosting the great cup is a real blessing, you know, nothing, nothing less than that. And, uh, can't think of a city that deserves it more, a fan base that deserves it more, um, to really celebrate for Canadians and put on a great show this year at, uh, at Great Cup and bring back, you know, really the single biggest sporting event that unites this country. There's nothing like it in Canada. And we are so thrilled and happy to be able to do it this year. And uh, and we're going to put on a great show and make everybody proud. Yeah, I, I mean, I we I was there the night, you know, the, the Great Cups were awarded, of course, 2021 and 20, uh, 2020 and 2021 announced at the same time. And just being in, the, you know, being in the club level there at Tim Hortons Field and to see the excitement of, of, of getting this bid announced. I mean, this has been years and years and years in the making and, and just maybe go down a little bit of the road that that how excited you are to be able to pull this off and, and, and just kind of your expectations for, for that weekend, that week around Great Cup. Well, yeah, I mean, it was a long time coming, and obviously, uh, you know, getting Tim Hortons Field built was uh, was key to that. And, and Tim Hortons Field and Hamilton is a great cup city, uh, uh, worthy city to host every year. Uh, so we're proud of that. We're proud of winning a competitive bid, and I know everybody in the CFL knows we're going to put on a great uh, a great show. And you know, we're just working through uh, some of the uh, um, issues that we're going to have to think through relative to where we are today versus where we're going to be in November. And of course. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts to it, but I think the one thing that everybody knows about our organization is, uh, you know, and I think maybe I'm most proud of is we're very resilient in our organization. You know, we'll, we'll get through it. You know, we've had to build temporary stadiums and we've had to move into, into stadiums that weren't quite ready. And we've had to rebuild the team on, on the field. And, uh, whenever we've tried to do, we've, we've really ultimately been pretty successful and, uh, we got a tough, resilient, creative group, um, that can really deal with any circumstance. And, uh, and I know they're going to do a great job led by Matt Afnick and our whole business staff. They're going to do a great job. And of course, we've got tremendous uh, support in the corporate community in Hamilton and our partners and our Tiger Town Council and our Moscow's Mini. So everyone's, everyone's going to dig in and, uh, and make sure this is going to be a tremendous show. And really, as I said, just a real great feel-good moment for Canadians to have, uh, have the great cut back. And it's one thing that I've, I've kind of I've made the argument that it feels like and I've, I've been covering this team, you know, six years now, and it feels like we have been building towards this moment. And I'm not trying to put any added expectations on the team or added pressure, of course. But, you know, you talk about Tim Hortons field. You've been in this role for, for over a decade now. The going through the Tim Hortons field process, uh, you know, the, the team itself losing those great cups, bringing in Jeremiah Masoli you know, eight years ago with Simone Lawrence and Coach O, and it just feels like we're building to something in 2021 that, that there's reasons for every Tiger Cat fan to be excited heading into the year. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think we, I think we built before. It's funny. You look back at those 13 and 14 seasons, the rowdy is that 15 team was, a, was an incredible team. And I don't yeah. think it's a question that that 2015 team was the best team in the league that year. And, uh, you know, we, we had beaten Edmonton out in Edmonton, really waxed them pretty good out in Edmonton. And then uh, I think we were 8-3 and three and had reeled off 10 or 11 straight at Tim Hortons Field. And we were we were beating Edmonton uh, at Tim Hortons Field. And people forget that Jake Olson went down in that game, uh, our starting left tackle, and then Zach went down. And I'll never forget Zach going down right in front of us, uh, right in front of the bench. And uh, so we had built up to that crescendo. And I think we were, I, I, you know, I think we were all convinced we were going to win it that year. Um and I think that was the best team in the league, honestly, in 2015. And uh, and we've kind of had to rebuild again. And I think, uh, as you said, I think we've we've built a great organization. Uh, that doesn't mean we're going to win 16 games in any given season. You need a lot of uh, good things to happen that way. But, uh, you know, I'm really proud of the organization we built. Uh, Coach O has done an incredible job with the staff and Berkey and Drew and Matt Afnick on the business side. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be we're going to be a good organization this year. We're going to be a good team. Um but there's going to be a lot of good teams in the league. I mean, everybody's improved, and uh, certainly there's going to be a bit of a bullet on us or target on us, uh, having had the success we had. But uh, I know we'll put on a good product in the field, and uh, with the support we got from the fans, I'm, uh, I think it's really going to be a special year for us. Uh, I, I don't think you're alone in, in thinking that it's going to be a, a special year for sure. Uh, Scott, I really appreciate the time. I know you're a very busy man, so uh, I, I will let you go. But thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it is great to see you. And hopefully, uh, once we get this thing full up and running, we'll get you back on, on the podcast here. Yeah, absolutely. I just want a big shout out to our fans. Again, big thanks again. And of course, uh, I see our staff a little bit, but big shout out to our staff and our players. And can't wait to see you guys all at, uh, 
at Tim Hortons Field and get ready for camp. Uh, it's going to be a great year. Well said. Thanks so much, Scott. Thanks, Louis. That, of course, was the CEO of the Hamilton Tiger Cats, Scott Mitchell, and I am Louis B. Thank you so much for tuning in to our first kind of foray into podcasting here. Uh, it's been great to have you on. It's been great to catch up with some of the guys. And uh, if you're like me and you listen to these, you're probably really, 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 really excited for uh, the 2021 Hamilton Tiger Cats season. You heard it there from Scott. You know, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Uh, we return to the field. And again, thank you so much for listening. And I did mention there that this is kind of our first foray into podcasting. We want to hear from you now. We want to hear what you want out of a podcast. Do you want more players? Do you want more coaches? Do you want alumni? Do you want guys who used to play for the Thai Cats? I guess that's the same thing as alumni, but did you guys who play for different teams maybe? Uh, we're going to open the floor to you. So let us know. You can hit me up on Twitter at Louis B underscore TV. You can hit us up on Twitter at Thai Cats and give us your feedback. Did you like this podcast? Was there something missing? Please let us know at Thai Cats at Louis B underscore TV. Can't wait to hear from you. I would like to thank our sponsor, Weather Tech Canada, uh, for helping us put together this podcast. I'd also like to thank Zach. Uh, who's doing all the hard work behind the scenes. Uh, he's doing a great job making sure that these uh, podcasts are going out. And the rest of the content team, they are fantastic as well. So I'm going to give him a shout out. Uh, shout out to Sophie, Dan the Man, Corey, of course, Mike, Michelle. They all do such a great job. And uh, I'm just the the face that they somehow try very hard to make look good. So thank you so much for joining us. Be tuned in. Follow us on Twitter at TyCads for all the latest news. And info regarding the 2021 season. Thanks for listening.